Welcome, everyone, and thank you for being here today. I would like to acknowledge we are within the territory of the Seashop First Nation. This is the Sunshine Coast Regional District regular board meeting of Thursday, February 27th, 2020. And I'd like to call us to order. Um, we have an amended agenda in front of us um, that has been further amended <laughs> with a couple of items. Uh, so before we adopt our amended amended agenda, I'd just like to um, point out that we have an item of new business uh, from Director Ties, um, and it's just regarding referral of the um, uh, the Sunshine or the Secret Cove Heights development to the OCPC for Roberts Creek. Um, and then I'm going to look to my directors and see if there's any other items that have been missed on the agenda that they would like to have added and look over to staff and see if there's anything that we've missed. Uh, it, yeah, just OC, yeah, Roberts Creek OCPC. Yes, Director McMahon. I did have an item, but I don't, well, I guess I could throw it in as new business. It's a Scredo contract. Scredo contract? Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Okay. So may I have a motion to adopt the amended agenda? So moved and seconded. All those in favor? Motion carries. Um, I'd like to also point out that, and I, I'm often remiss in pointing out the upcoming meeting dates at the end of our agenda, but before the package actually starts. We have all of our uh, APC committees are on there, as, uh, so all of our regional district meetings as well as additional meetings that are are in the month ahead. So everything from Seashell Library Board to Gibsons and District Private Library Board to the local government show is on that list. So for anybody that wants to see what we're doing or when our meeting schedules are for the next month, they're always there. So we don't have lives? Yeah. <laughs> we have no lives. <sighs> Anyways, uh, with that, we're going to move on to the regular board meeting minutes of February 13th, 2020, Annex A, pages 1 through 8 of your package. Uh, may I have a motion uh, to receive and adopt, please? So moved, seconded. Are there any errors, omissions, changes, deletions? See none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Motion carries. Uh, do we have any business arriving from the minutes or unfinished business? Look over to staff, anything there? Directors? Seeing none, uh, we have no presentations and delegations today, but we have, uh, we have a very full agenda beyond this. I'm going to ask for a motion to receive all reports, and then we'll start going working through our package. Motion to receive, seconded. All those in favor? Motion carries. First up on our list, uh, number three, Annex B, pages 9 through 22 of the package. Uh, we have our Special Corporate Administrative Services Committee uh, recommendations, numbers 1 through 29 and 31 to 41 of February 10th and 11th, 2020, also known as round two budget. Um, are there any that you'd like to pull out, uh, Director Toth? I'd like to pull recommendation 12. Recommendation number 12. Okay. Director? Uh, okay. Okay, so on page 13. Directors, are there any other recommendations you'd like to pull out to discuss separately before we move the, um, the block as a whole? Seeing none, I'll call, uh, uh, I'll ask for a motion to adopt recommendations uh, with the exception of number 12. So if I can ask for a motion to adopt everything else. So moved, seconded. All those in favor? Motion carries. And Director Toth, to you for recommendation number 12 on page 13. Thank you. Um, I can't vote in favor of this substantial of a staff increase. Um, staff in strategic initiatives are intended to handle long range planning of some of our capital works so that we spend less energy playing catch up. I get that. Water supply projects, landfill capacity issues, emergency planning, regional growth. We do have a need for more forward planning than has been done in the past. 
our staff are coming in on the weekends to get their work done. I get it. However, we're already making incremental changes to the staffing. We're adding new managers and new support staff. We're adding a metering technician, even though our metering program is currently incomplete. We're adding a planner and a communications manager, and, and, and. I'm not willing to entertain strategic planning department until such time that the impact on our staff capacity from these incremental increases and changes are known and realized. And I will continue to oppose a budget that incorporates these particular staff positions in it all the way through to final adoption. I don't feel that a sufficiently robust business case has been provided to support these positions. I think these positions would either be better suited as deferred to 2022 or beyond or contracted out on a limited duration basis. If we hire these staff, the only way we'll ever get rid of them is to pay out a tremendous amount of severance. The strategic initiatives positions are going to add $221,008 to the 2020 tax bill, which increases to 386407 for 2021 and beyond. Okay. Um, I'm going to look to any other directors. So, uh, Director McMahon. <clears throat> With respect to the points raised, uh, part of the problem here, I think, is that Director Toth was not here to be part of our strategic planning, you know, a year and a half ago or a year ago or whenever it was that we did it. It, it took quite a while. Some of these positions were extensively discussed at that time, um, particularly the communications manager, which has been a lack here at the SCRD for a very long time and is critically needed. So uh, I'm, I'm, I was going to say comfortable. That, that's probably overstating it somewhat, but I think we have to take the recommendations of our staff on what is actually needed to get the job done that we want to get done. Um, uh, Director Toth? Uh, with, with all due respect, I actually was part of the strategic planning process all the way through, um, recognizing that as at the time I was an alternate director. Uh, there may have been things that come up in, in intermediate meetings that maybe I didn't attend or were in closed session. We talked about a communications manager at strategic planning. We did not talk about the strategic initiatives division, um, and, and I still feel that it's premature on, on the metering technician. Because again, we don't have all our meters in. Okay, I'm going to look to directors for any other uh, comments. Uh, keeping in mind, we don't actually have a, um, a motion on the floor regarding the, this uh, recommendation at this time. So, um, because we've pulled this one out of the package, right? Um, so I see Director McMahon would like to move that recommendation, and Director Seegers would uh, second that. Is there any further discussion on adopting this recommendation? I'm sensing a potential of a no. Going twice. Okay, I'm going to call the question. All those in favor of adopting the res? Oh, sorry, Director Hilt, did you want? Or are you? Voting. Oh, you're voting. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm trying to make sure that everybody has enough space to speak if they need to. Um, I'm going to call the question on this. All those in favor of adopting adopting this recommendation? Okay, we're doing voting. So all of whom? Oh, and I'm voting in favor as well. Those opposed? And would you like that registered? Okay. And did I see the CFO with a hand? No, we're all good. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, moving on, number four on our agenda is the Planning and Community Development Committee recommendations, numbers one through seven, nine to 17 of February 13th, 2020. Uh, Annex C, pages 23 to 27 of your package. Directors, would you like to pull out any of those recommendations to debate separately or before we move them as a block? Seeing none, I'll ask for a motion to adopt these recommendations. So moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Motion carries. Number five, the Infrastructure Services Committee recommendations, numbers one through 13 of February 20th, 2020, Annex D, pages 28 through 31 of your package. Uh, directors, would you like to pull out any of those recommendations before we move them as a block? C, 
Seeing none, I'll ask for a motion to adopt these recommendations, please. So moved, seconded. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Motion carries. Uh, next, 5A on the agenda is the Corporate Administrative Services Committee recommendations um, from earlier today, uh, pages 31 to B of your package. This is a printout that you'll have added, had received. Uh, we have four recommendations from earlier today. Uh, the Poverty Reduction Strategy, Community Emergency Preparedness Fund, uh, signage on the Sunshine Coast, and delegation regarding COVID-19 coronavirus. Um, directors, would you like to do, debate any of these separately before we move them as a block? Seeing none, I'll ask for a motion to adopt these recommendations. So moved, seconded. Any further discussion? I'll call the question. All those in favor? Motion carries. Okay, number six on our agenda, Annex E, pages 32 to 33 in on our package. Uh, our building official, notice on title, um, Mr. Whittleton, would you like to introduce, please? Or, oh, sorry, GM Hall, I'll, I'll let you go first. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, section 57.1 of the Community Charter allows for notice on title to be registered where a building official considers a condition with respect to land, building, or other structures that contravenes a regional district bylaw or a provincial regulation. The process serves to protect the regional district and our mandate to ensure safe building and development and to protect future owners of property. Uh, the process involves issuing of four notices uh, to the owner, including a registered letter. These notices provide an opportunity for owners to provide information to resolve the concern or to agree on a path to compliance. The decision to place a notice on title is a board decision and if a report is brought forward by staff to the board, it means that the owner has not responded to the notices or has not indicated an interest in rectifying the contravention. A notice can simply be removed when the unsafe or non-conforming condition is rectified. And so staff have in the report today identified two properties where there's a recommendation for notice on title to be placed. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you GM Hall. Uh, so we have uh, two um, properties in front of us today for notice on title. Um, I'm going to check with the audience first and see if we have um, uh, any representative from 9434 Stevens Way and Half Moon Bay in the audience. Okay. Um, the second uh, property is 2623 Gulfstream Road uh, slash 2607 Lower Road, Roberts Creek. Do we have a member in the audience? Okay, certainly. If you'd like to come up to the microphone, sir, and identify yourself and your interest with this property. Uh, my name's Ken White. Okay. The owner of the property that we're talking about here, uh, with my wife and so on, but yeah. Um, so we own that property. And uh, would you like to address the board uh, with uh, in regards to the uh, notice on title? Okay. Okay. Uh, the issue that brought all this up has been outstanding for a while. Uh, apparently, one of my neighbors uh, made an accusation to the district about my property, and the SCRD staff went to my property without any notice, they just came. And I guess they noticed that there's some man-made objects on the property and went back to the office looking for the paperwork that normally would follow this kind of thing. Couldn't find it. Couldn't find the paperwork. And because they couldn't find it, determined that it doesn't exist because it couldn't be found, so it doesn't exist. The, uh, since then, there have been the notices that were referred to in the report. Uh, I have communicated back and forth with staff, trying to find some kind of solution here, trying to understand exactly what is going on, because there has been no opportunity for me to confront my accuser, 
ask any questions. Uh, there's been no evidence. There's no independently rendered decision. And yet, as the staff member just read out, my situation is claimed as a finding of guilt. In our system, we don't do that. We have to hear the evidence. There has to be a presumption as we go through that we're trying to work to some kind of solution. <coughs> what we have here with the notice on title, uh, trying to get that done, is that is beginning an enforcement action prior to a conviction. There hasn't been a conviction. There hasn't even been evidence heard. And yet we want to move to that. I don't think that's right. I understand that the SCRD wants protection so that I can't go and sell my property and some poor innocent person inherits this problem. I understand that. And, and I agree with the necessity for that. So what I have done, and I think you all have a copy, uh, is I have offered my own undertaking that I will not sell the property or transfer it or seek to in any way dispose of it until the issue is finally decided by an independent body who will hear the evidence and so forth. That undertaking gives you more protection than a notice on title does. And I think that each of you, as you vote on this, should bear that in mind, that I'm offering a solution that respects the needs of the SCRD, but it also respects me. Thank you, Mr. Knight. Um, if you'd like to just stay there just uh, right. while we're um, going to look to the board and directors, uh, if you have any questions either for Mr. Knight or for um, our staff. Um, so um, I have, uh, I saw Director Seegers. And I'm going to go to Director Ties first because it is his area. Um, yeah, yeah, so my question is, is what exactly is it that uh, you're looking for, um, you know, you say that there's, there's built, there's structures on the property. There's no paperwork here at the SCRD for it, um, which means that it, there probably was never a permit applied for it. Um, so what kind of process are you looking for to get resol resolution to your problem? Well, I would imagine, obviously, if we can't sort it out amongst ourselves, it would go to court. In other words, it would, the decision would be rendered. That is the normal process. If you, if you reach a, a, a dispute, and I'm certainly disputing it, uh, that at some point there will be an independent body who will hear what the district has to say, hear what I have to say, and make a decision. I'm just going to go over to staff and just confirm what process is. Uh, regarding um, notice on title, if you can just walk us through what the what process typically is. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, so the process for notice on title is described in Section 57 of the Community Charter. Yeah, and it involves uh, a building inspector who has. Um, uh, authority under the Building Act um, to observe a condition, report it, bring a recommendation forward, and for uh, local government to, to make the determination whether they feel it's appropriate to place uh, notice on the title. And um, the process to remove it is um, Simil similarly straightforward, but is uh, administrative, so board direction is not required for removal. Thanks. Uh, thank you for clarifying, GM Hall. Um, got a speakers list happening here. I've got Director Seekers, Director Lee, and then Director McMahon. Thank you. Uh, so, Mr. Knight, you have, there are buildings that were built on this property that the building inspector. Oh, yeah, I live in one. Okay. Yeah. Now, you said we don't have copy of the documentation. Do you have a copy of the documentation? Uh, well, I used building, to. Building I used permit? To. I, I, I used to have all of the copies. Long ago, it's been everything I thought had been recycled. What I have got, which is, I don't know if it's any use to anything, but I mean, I did, in going through all of my, my remaining files, 
I did find that there's, I have a couple of the floor plans uh, from the house that we're living in, but I don't have anything else left. The long ago, you know, we don't keep that, the paper any longer. And, uh, you know, I sort of trusted that the SCRD would keep the uh, paperwork in, in order, and there's no sense me keeping it. So you believe you applied for a building permit at the time? No, I, don't, I did. I don't believe I did. I did. Okay, and we don't have copies yeah, of but that. But you don't seem to have copies, apparently. This mm -hmm. is what I was told, that, that uh, we looked mm -hmm. and couldn't find them. Uh, sir. GM Hall. Uh, thank you, Chair. SCRD does have permits associated with this property uh, dating from 1998, 1994, and two from 1994, uh, one of which was renewed. They relate to constructing a dwelling, con uh, constructing a workshop or single family dwelling, and another one for a dwelling. And they they do not relate to the construction that is um, the matter leading to the recommendation for notice and title, which specifically relates to a carport, a woodshed or shop building, and in addition to a second floor to an auxiliary building, I believe. Thank you. Okay. A follow-up? Mm -hmm. So do you have building permits for those pieces that they're referring to? That's what we're talking about here today. I thought. I thought that's what we were discussing. Okay, so a notice on title is does protect us. It does. But it also is to protect somebody else. That's right, a future a potential buyer. If I was to try to quickly sell it or something. Or somebody who comes on the property and you own it and something happens and they come after us for something that is potentially oh, unsafe. Yeah, yeah, okay. So it's not even if you just sell it, it's, it's all of that. Mm -hmm. um, we do not take you to court. There's no court process. The notice goes on title. Once it's on title, if you remediate as per our building department, then it's a simple requ request and a small fee to actually get it removed. We don't take you to court and evict you from the property. That's not part of the process. It is a notice on title and that's it. So you're vendor in the verdict. I'm saying that we haven't voted on that, but that's what the process mm, is. That's what you're doing. That's what the process yeah. is. Okay. okay. And that is our that is up to us as a board mm -hmm. to render a verdict. Okay. And so that will happen if I today. understand correctly, the evidence that you're that you have, unless you have something else, I haven't been told of it, mm -hmm. is that we looked for it, we looked for paperwork, we couldn't find it. That's the evidence? Is there something else that I have not been informed of that would sway the mm -hmm. situation? I don't know. Um, I'd say that's probably questions for staff, and then I can go over to Director Ty okay. again. Well, whomever, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair. Um, the process of looking for paperwork is uh, is diligence undertaken uh, to corroborate what is observed on site, mm -hmm. and so based on an inspection by a building official and observing work that does not. Ha on a, a diligence check does not have substantiating permit, um, leads into a process of notification to an owner that there may be an issue and uh, an opportunity to be heard prior to the placement of notice on title. Okay, I'm gonna go to Director Ty, so this is his area. Director Lee and Director McMahon, I still have you on, on the list as well. Okay, well, you, you can see how the, the position you place us in and, and saying, basically anybody that's getting a notice put on title could come along and say, well, you guys don't have the records. And I mean, that's, uh, so that's neither here nor there right now. Um, and uh, essentially a notice on title isn't the end of the world because it's easily removed. So uh, I think, you know, calling it placing judgment right now or making it um, some sort of a admission of guilt or anything like that is is not I, I don't think I would escalate it to that term but um, it, I, I, I think it's um, you know I, whether the argument is valid or not I it's difficult for us as a board to be able to say uh, to to, uh, to make judgment on that right now so um, I'll well, give can it I to ask the other question. Yeah. Let's say you're at home and you're on your way out the door. 
you reach into your drawer by the door for your car keys. You can't find them. Would you conclude that they don't exist, or would you conclude that they're misplaced? Well, that's a good question. Yeah, well. So what would you conclude? That's, that's your conclusion. There's only no, one party would, involved, right? I'm asking right? what you would conclude. Given the that situation, what would you conclude? Well, I've lost, I've lost my car you keys. You lost your keys, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. But so you're, you're, only, so you're legitimate talking about one party concern. and not okay. several parties, so. Um, I'm going to go over to staff, and then I'm going to continue through our speakers list. Uh, GM Hall. Uh, thank you, Chair. If it's helpful to the discussion at hand, SCRD maintains a secure record management system with controlled access that significantly reduces the likelihood of losing uh, permits for, well, any, any building permits. Uh, and um, staff have checked records and do not believe this is a case of misplaced paperwork. We've also taken the step of reviewing financial transactions that would support uh, a permit application, and no financial transactions were found that would substantiate that a permit application was made. Uh, or, or approved. And staff would note that placement of notice on title is a precautionary measure that protects the regional district and future owners. And in the absence of completed permits, it's reasonable for SCRD to take the step. Thank you. Okay, I have Director Lee, and then Director McMahon, and then Director Toth. Um, I understand that there's three separate buildings, structures that a permit would have been required. My assumption is there would have been three permits issued at different times. Um, and the contention is, is that both parties have lost their files for six permits. If, do I have that right? No, you don't. Um, no, the, the one thing that was, was brought up, I, I haven't, as I said, before. I haven't had the opportunity yet to talk to the person who made the accusation in the first place. So I, I'm a little bit in the dark there. Uh, but the one structure that is being referred to has been there for decades. So that, that's not, I don't know if there's ever was a permit on that thing. I mean, it was there before we bought it. Uh, the other thing, the second thing is there's, there's the issue of some stairs or something that was mentioned. I took down the rotten stairs that were there and I rebuilt them. I don't need a permit to do that. The last thing we're talking about is the carport that's there and there was a permit taken out. We're talking about a single permit, not six permits, not three permits. We're talking about one. Okay. I'd, I'd like to hear staff's uh, version of that one if I could. I will look over to staff, please. Uh, yes, the, uh, the three, uh, three issues, one is certainly the carport that was uh, um, noticed on site. The second uh, building was a wood storage building. Uh, it um, is certainly larger than the exemption that would preclude uh, uh, us not issuing a permit for it. And the third issue was uh, on the second floor of an existing building, the Stairs had been replaced and there had been some structural changes to the um, landing at the top of that, uh, on the top of that set of stairs. So those were the three, the three items that were mentioned in the, uh, in the report. Okay, I have Director McMahon. Yeah, I have a question since these kind of things come up in all the rural areas. So say I have a property with a carport and I discovered for some reason that there was never any building permit issued for the carport. So what is the logical next step? Like, does it get inspected? Do I have to remediate? Like, like how does this play out? Oh, that's a good technical question for uh, our staff. Uh, we certainly would work with an owner to bring that into compliance uh, by way of a permit application, uh, drawings and inspections. Uh, things that would need to be checked would be the siting of it, the setbacks to, to the property line, uh, as if it was permitted or uh, applied for before the building was built, we would just sort of do it in reverse. But the, certainly there's a, a process that we could go through. 
and also to speak to it that um, in my other hat as a realtor, I've come across where um, uh, uh, clients in the rural areas um, having built a house without getting final occupancy on it. And because they built the house back in the 80s and having to ask for, um, go back and, and go through archives for the final occupancy. And, um, and is what happens is, you know, you finish building your house and you move in and you forget about the final occupancy and, and things happen. And in, that, in those cases, you can go and you can ask for, there's another kind of permit you can get. Um, I forget the actual name of it, but it's, I believe it's a, it's a health and it's a safety, essentially a safety assessment of the property and they, they do an inspection. It's the same, it's similar to the pr same process as a building inspection, but it's just to ensure that the home is safe to live in and has been safe to live in for the 30 years prior that it has been lived in. So um, it's a personal experience that I've been through myself. So I know there is a process there. Uh, Director Tall. Um, so three items, the carport, the woodshed, and uh, a set of stairs and landing. Can't really speak to the, to the third item, but I know that carports and woodsheds are built up here every day, and I'm sure there aren't permits issued for all of them. So I actually have two questions for staff. Do we know how many permits are issued for woodsheds in a year as an order of magnitude number? I don't know offhand if the building was less than 10 square meters, it wouldn't need a permit, so there might be uh, thousands of them out there. Um, and certainly there are buildings uh, all the time that are built without permits, and when it comes to our attention, then we uh, try to uh, achieve compliance with our bylaws. Okay. Which and then leads into my, my second question. Um, do notice on titles have any impact for a homeowner on mortgages, mortgage renewals, or insurance? I'm not sure if that's a question I can answer. It, it may, but I'm not, uh, I, I'm not sure. Um, so to my right, <laughs> if you can, do you have a? I have some recommendations I'd like to make. First property uh, that we place notice on title and yep. we do them separately. Okay. Yep, that's what I was going to do anyway. Yep. Okay. Um, but we are, we're not sure to the answer to Director Toth's question on whether or not that would uh, hamper mortgage or... Or in Not or in a short title? Notice on title. Notice on title, you can't get a mortgage. If you've got an or existing mortgage? mortgage. Property. If you've got an existing mortgage? Um, you can renew your existing mortgage. You cannot get a new mortgage. Okay. Um, and do you know about insurance as the follow-up to that, if it has an impact? Depends on the what the notice on title is in so pertains to, yeah. Okay, so I'd like a recommendation that 9434 Stevens Way, we put a, motion, a motive, notice on title. So the recommendation the record, as on. indicated, yeah. Okay, so on. One. Yep, so we'll start this out as on page 32, the first, we're going to deal with the first property uh, that the corporate officer be authorized to file a notice on t at the land title office, and this is for the property at Stevens Way. So you'd like to make that motion. Do I have a seconder? I see a seconder. Any further discussion on the Stevens Way property? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Motion carries. Okay. Oh, just a second. I have Director Lee. Yes, thank you. I have uh, one final question. Um, the, um, the stairs involves a landing, which um, I understand would easily become a safety issue if that was to fall down, so, such as balconies have in the past. So that concerns me that there is no building, no apparent building permit. The other question I have, it sounds like the woodshed's a fairly substantial building and probably is used for storage as well as a woodshed. Is, is that correct? Um, I'll, uh, Mr. Knight? I can't say it only would, but it is, that would be like, I don't know about full notice on it, but it's, wood, it's a woodshed. I, I store dry wood in there and that's, like 99% of what's in there. But I mean, I can't sit here and tell you there's absolutely nothing else. Okay, um, Director Seegers. Okay, so I'm gonna make a recommendation that um, rather than the recommendation put forward here that we give the proponent 30 days and that this come back before us in 30 days. In that time frame, 
we're expecting that you get this resolved with our building department. At that point, it will come back for a decision from the board to move forward with the notice on title. So that's my recommendation. I look for a seconder. Okay, I see a seconder. Um, I'm going to look uh, look over to staff and see if there's um, any implications to that procedurally or legislatively. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, nope, a 30-day extension is fine. It prolongs the period of risk, but um, it's only for 30 days. Okay. And staff are um, happy to continue working with the owner towards compliance. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other questions from directors? Um, oh, sorry, Director Hilt. Sure. Um, to, to the applicant, is, is it clear in your mind what the building inspection department is asking you to come into compliance? Is it clear? Is there? A, do you understand what they're asking? Yes, they're asking me to do it again. They ask me to go through the process again, pay all the fees again, go do everything again. If they're asking. I'm wrong. I, I would. I would like to be corrected, but that's not what they're asking. I that's will. What they're asking. Okay, and I'll look over to staff <coughs> for clarification on what's being asked of the applicant. I uh, wouldn't say that it is again, and our, our opinion is that there were no permits issued, so we would be, and if there had been, uh, yes, we would ask them to do it again. There are no records that we have for these, uh, these structures, so it would be uh, starting the process over again. Director Seekers? I have a question for the proponent. Are you willing to work with our building inspectors? I've been trying to since to this started. Yeah, if, if you don't obviously have all of the correspondence, but I mean, I have been mm -hmm. trying to mm -hmm. work it out. Uh, you know, and that's even here with my undertaking. I, you know, I'm trying to find a solution that respects everybody. Uh, okay, but know, I, I, it I don't sounds like they need to be overwhelmed with some yes. bunch of laws. I'm trying to work the thing out, and I think I'd be happy to try to do that. I think that's how we ought to be approaching this thing. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so we have a motion in front of us. Uh, directors, do I see any other questions on this or comments? Anything else from staff, proponents? Okay, I'm going to call the question on uh, on this. Is everyone clear what you're voting on? 30-day extension comes back to the board in 30 days. Okay. Oh, sorry, Director Hill. It'll be coming to board meeting, not a committee. So it'll be coming, it'll be coming so to board. So that would be as, um, as the same way it has today. So that's the we're February. So that's going to be. Uh, that would be uh, our I, March 26 board meeting. March 26. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So. March 26. Yep. Yeah. Uh, well, that would be actually four weeks. So March 26. So do you want to? Okay. So we'll need it because we have a specific motion that says 30 days. Can I ask for an amendment to come back to the March 26th? March 26th. Okay, so amended, uh, or pardon me, move an amendment. Can I have a seconder for that? Seconded. Any further questions? I'll call the question on the amendment to March 26th board meeting. All those in favor? The amendment carries. So we now have an amended motion in front of us that this comes back to the board at the March 26th board meeting uh, if, if, if the issue has not been resolved. Or outstanding issues have not been resolved. Is everyone clear now? Clear as clear as process can be. <laughs> Excellent. I'm calling the question on the amended motion. All those in favor? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Knight, and thank you, staff. Okay. Uh, so we have taken care of Annex E. Next up on our list is Annex F, the Chief Administrative Officer's Report of February 27, 2020. Um, our CAO is currently in um, at a conference, so he's not here to answer any questions, but he's certainly left his senior leadership team to answer questions on his behalf. So if you'd like to ask them any questions <laughs> about anything within the report. Oh, just a second. Got it. Hey, that's a handy little mute I know, tool. I, know. <laughs> I can mute anybody I want. I know. Excellent. Okay, so uh, so our CAO's report, um, starting on page 34, 35, is there uh, any questions for uh, the senior leadership team on their uh, on the CAO's report? Okay, 
<laughs> now that the boss is boss is away. So there you go. Uh, Director Hiltz, please. Uh, thanks. It's on page 34. It's uh, with regards to the the re respectful workplace policy. Um, there was an old workplace respectful policy, and there has been changes. I just what's what would be the difference between the old and the new? Do we know? I'm, I'm kind of I'm, I'm shorting you on this because I I didn't really kind of clue into me about the old and the new, but you might not have all the details. Are you asking whether we're getting more respectful or less respectful? Okay. <laughs> Over to staff. Are we getting more or less respectful? Well, I think they're just in recognition to any changes uh, regarding any uh, work days for uh, labor-related updates. So we haven't seen a, a draft yet, but that'll be that'll be coming forward. Thank you, uh, Director McMahon. Perhaps we can convey this to the CAO, but at some future meeting, uh, it would be nice to see uh, a report on opportunities for collaboration that the CAOs have been exploring because I've heard anecdotally of a number of things that are being explored right now, all of which sound really interesting and uh, positive. So we look forward to hearing more. Okay. So, so noted, looking for more uh, information on collaboration among CAOs and, and the, uh, all of our staff. Um, compliment. Uh, any other questions on the CAOs report? So we've already received this for information. So if there's no more questions, we're going to move on to the next item on our... Oh, I'm going to look over to staff, please. Thank you, Chair. We have a procedural matter that we'd like to um, move to reconsider recommendation number 13 from the February 10th and 11th Special Corporate and Administrative Services Committee. Um, okay. Page 14 of the agenda. Page 14 of the agenda. Okay, one moment, please. We'll find. Okay, so um, so a procedural matter on uh, referring recommendation number thirteen. Thank you, Chair. So what um, what I believe we have is a proposed amendment from the CFO. But in order to consider that, the board would need to bring the business back onto the floor by way of a motion to reconsider that recommendation. So I'm going to um, ask, we have to bring it back to the floor to reconsider. Can we be clear that we're taking the business off of the floor? Okay, so recommendation number 13, which is 2020 R2 budget proposal for space planning. Okay. And staff is asking that the board make a motion to bring it back for reconsideration. Okay, so, so moved, seconded. All those in favor for reconsidering? Okay. Now we're curious. Now we are really curious. Um, yes, please go ahead. So it's actually a positive uh, impact. So on the third line down for the information technology expenditure, which is outlined for $64,000, uh, 64035 through taxation, um, that should actually be 37934 um, There were some calculation errors um, found and some, some, some backup um, so okay. it's actually a reduction. Okay, so function 117, information technology, the, uh, the number should be 37934. Correct. Um, yes. And that's being funded out of taxation. No, it's Sorry. also the funding source is incorrect. Okay. It should be through support services. Okay. Through support services. Yeah, and the annual cost of 3390 is correct. Okay. And the last funding source two should be amended to support services. Excellent. Okay, uh, directors, is everyone clear on that? So once again, that's item 117, information technology. Uh, the one-time cost, 37934 Funding source is support services. Annual cost is 3390 Funding source, support services. Uh, Director Toss. Is that reflected in that 99,790, or is that number also needing to be updated? The total. Thank you. One moment, please.
And then the follow-up question to that is if, if that number is not correct, what number is actually in our financial plan? So the number in the financial plan are the correct values. So the schedules have been amended uh, accordingly. So the value uh, chair sh should be uh, 73,689. Okay. So thank you, Justice. All right. Is everyone clear? Okay. So now we've brought this forward for reconsideration. Okay. So we've, we now need a new motion to adopt the, this, uh, this recommendation as amended. So moved and seconded. Seconded. Any discussion on this item? Seeing none, I'm going to call the question. All those in favor? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Excellent. All right. So uh, we are now under communications. Um, may I ask for a motion to receive communications, please? So moved. Seconded. All those in favor? Motion carries. Um, and so communication 7A from our very own director ties. We have a, um, a new business item or a, a communications item. And director ties, would you like to uh, introduce this please under communications on 35A and 35B? Uh, sure, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I got this email yesterday through uh, uh, my, our contacts at the Climate Caucus. Um, Director McMahon is also a member. Um, and um, in case you don't know, the Climate Caucus is uh, about 200 elected officials that have kind of combined for, uh, forces to, uh, to move um, climate policy forward. Um, and uh, one of the things that we have the opportunity to do here is uh, to uh, write letters of support to the interveners in the Canada Supreme Court case uh, for the Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act. Uh, the interveners uh, that we have here in the province is the City of Vancouver, the City of Richmond, the City of Nelson, the District of Squamish, the City of Rosalind, and the City of Victoria. And uh, the, they are the interveners uh, on this case. And it's uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Ontario. They're fighting the Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act. And um, so that's going in front of the um, uh, Supreme Court in March. And that's why I uh, hurried to put it on the uh, agenda today. Because uh, if we're going to have a meaningful letter of support for these interveners, uh, then uh, now is the time rather than... Uh, at our next board meeting, at which point it will already be in front of the courts. Um, it's uh, it the Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act essentially is the act that uh, federally puts a, a price on carbon. Um, and um, it has been acknowledged to be the best tool uh, available to reduce our carbon emissions. Uh, on a national level, and um, so if I'm asking the board to support uh, this letter of support or to write a letter of support um, for these interveners. Okay, uh, thank you, Director Ties. I'm going to look to the directors to see if you have any uh, questions or comments for Director Ties. Uh, keep in mind, we do not currently have a motion on the floor, but um, if you have any uh, questions or comments for Director Ties regarding this communication. Director Hiltz. Uh, role of an intervener in Supreme Court of Canada. What, what role do they play? That's a really good question. Director Ties, can you answer that? <laughs> Staff, do you have an answer to that? <laughs> what the role of an intervener has uh, with the Supreme Court of Canada? <laughs> Sorry, Chair, we, we aren't law experts. No, no, okay. So um, so it's a good question. Uh, 
um, what because they're what are the implications of being coming part of the uh, supporting the interveners uh, director McMahon I could be wrong I don't think at this point in the process that there are any implications that we are just expressing our public support because if you look uh, at the last paragraph um, applications to intervene closed back in November so we are merely expressing public support for the position that we're taking. Thank you, Director McMahon, for being a, uh, uh, an avid reader and finding that in there. Thank you. Okay, Director Hiltz, does that answer your question? Um, yeah, no, well, I, it, no, it doesn't. Um, do, like, do they have standing? Uh, I, yeah, this has been going back from August, and essentially they're challenging the constitutionality of the federal government to impose attacks on provincial governments and they're challenging the, the federal government and that is the constitutionality and um, you know this is a, a fight between the, the feds and the provinces and uh, um, I'm just wondering you know is I agree with it as, as you know as, a, as an individual um, is, is it a is a role in our advocacy that's you know I'm just finding consistency about the role and uh, not not being that up to date about the, the it's, it's a fairly significant court case. Um, Alberta's just went, uh, their court of appeal just overturned, uh, ruled in favor of Alberta, what, two or three days ago? Um, so Saskatchewan, Ontario, Alberta are all going to the Supreme Court with the feds. And I'm going, what's, where's the regional district fit in that? And it seems to be kind of a, a little higher up than uh, local government. But I, I, you know, I understand the letter of support, which is kind of the climate emergency, but in terms of this specific court action, I'm. I'm, I'm not sure. That's uh, Director Tuck. I did find a Government of Canada website um, and it explains what an intervener is. An intervener is a person or organization who does not have a direct interest in a particular court or tribunal proceeding but is granted intervener status on a discretionary basis because their involvement would be helpful to the determination of the issues. Uh, the intervener's participation rights are determined by the tribunal member and are generally more limited than those of a party. Uh, for example, intervention is widely used by specialized organizations and advocacy groups to present submissions before courts and tribunals on issues of public interest within their expertise. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Google. Okay. Directors, we have this correspondence on the floor or we don't even have it on the floor, we're just discussing. Uh, Director Ties. Yes, and uh, on page 35A, um, there is a, a resolution uh, that uh, starts at about middle of the page saying, whereas carbon pricing is widely acknowledged as the most effective tool in combating climate change, and whereas the Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act, the GGPPA, is essential to implementing a national carbon pricing program, and whereas carbon pricing has been in effect in the province of British Columbia since 2008, has shown to be an effective tool in slowing the growth of emissions and during which time BC has enjoyed one of the fastest growing economies in the country, be it resolved that the Sunshine Coast Regional District provide a letter to the in interveners, uh, City of Vancouver, City of Richmond, City of Nelson, District of Squamish, City of Rosalind and City of Victoria supporting their arguments in favor of the Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act and the ability to take local action on GHG emissions to be heard by the Supreme Court on March the 17th, 2020. Okay, so you're moving that uh, as a motion. I'm gonna look for a seconder. Seconded. Any further discussion on the motion on, well, the motion is now on the floor. Any discussion on this motion? Director Tall. I support the idea in principle. Uh, I'm, I'm a little hesitant to sign us on to Supporting their arguments, um, I just don't see enough information here about what exactly their arguments <coughs> are. Okay. I'm going to look around for any other uh, director hilts. Um, yeah, I, yeah I, I'm confused because the court case is about the constitutionality, not the effectiveness of the of carbon pricing. So that's where I'm kind of, am, am I? Is this a letter of support for carbon pricing? or the constitutionality of the federal government imposing it on provincial governments, that's where I'm not quite clear what a letter of support is. You know, I'd be happy to participate in a letter of support saying about climate change, 
but this is my understanding is this is about the constitutionality of the federal government imposing taxation on provincial governments. So I don't see the letter of support matching up with what the actual court case is. That's where I'm, I'm confused about it. Okay. Uh, directors, any other comments, questions? Director Seegers? Um, I actually just had an opportunity to read this now. I, I'm with Director Cox. I don't feel I have enough background to be able to support this. I don't really understand where they're going with this. Okay. Any further comments? Questions, discussion to the motion on the floor. The motion was uh, on page 35A, the, the, uh, the resolution that we provide a letter to the interveners uh, supporting the, our arguments in favor of the Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act. Everyone is clear that what the motion is on the floor or what the resolution is on the floor? Okay, I'm not seeing any other. Okay, Director McMahon. As a, as a board, perhaps over lunch, one of these days when we actually have time at lunch, we should probably have a, a discussion about our processes for letters of support. Um, you know, this is a worthy cause, but we are late to the party here. And so I think that we should just, you know, as directors think, think about this a little. This would be one vote each. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, so yes, it's been seconded. So we've been, that's why we've been uh, discussing it further. So, okay. Seeing no more questions, we all vote on this. One vote each. I'm going to call the question. All those in favor of the resolution on the floor? Okay. Those opposed? Okay. Motion is defeated. Um, uh, Director Ties, uh, would you pass the feedback on that? Would you like a motion for us to pass the feedback on corporate officer or is that sufficient what we've done here? Because it came direct director ties specifically, uh, just following up on process, closing that loop after. Sorry, the loop you're closing with respect to uh, a process for letters of support? Yeah. It, well, letters of not support, it wasn't supported at this table for the reasons given. Director right. Ties can just bring that back to Climate Caucus yes. without uh, any kind of resolution. Oh, yes, from he us. can, correct. Oh, perfect. Just wanted to confirm. Thank you. Uh, yes, Director Todd. Might be worth in your feedback to them uh, timing, just given the short timeline and given that the intervener status is closed on March 6th, uh, there has been lots of opportunity for them to seek letters of support from the intern. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. Great. But uh, thank you very much for uh, for bringing it forward and offering us some uh, an opportunity at some discussion. So, terrific. Okay. Moving on. We're on page two of our agenda, our amended agenda. Uh, we have no motions, but we have a number of bylaws today. We all know how much I love bylaws. Uh, woo! Um, okay. So Annex G, pages 36 to 37 of your package, is uh, for the Roberts Creek Official Community Plan Amendment Bylaw, number 641.12-2019. So this is a bylaw to amend the Roberts Creek Official Community Plan. Um, so we're looking for third reading and adoption at this meeting. Electoral area directors, you will be the ones voting. You get one vote each. So may I have a motion for third reading of Roberts Creek Official Community Plan Amendment Bylaw, number 641.12-2019. Uh, so moved <laughs> and seconded. <laughs> Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Rural directors, motion carries. And may I have a motion for adoption of Roberts Creek Official Community Plan Amendment Bylaw Number 641.12-2019. Electoral Area Directors only, one vote each. So moved adoption. So moved. Seconded. All those in favor? Motion carries. Thank you. Next up on the docket, we have Annex H, pages 38 to 40 of your package. 
uh, were electoral area directors again, one vote each for um, the Sunshine Coast Regional District Zoning Amendment Bylaw number 310.185-2019. May I have a motion for third reading, please? So moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Motion carries. That was third reading. And may I have a motion for adoption for Sunshine Coast Regional District Zoning Amendment by number 310.185, 2019. So moved adoption. Seconded. All those in favor? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. We now have Annex I, pages 41 to 42 of our package. And this is um, the Sunshine Coast Regional District Zoning Amendment Bylaw number 310184. This is for second reading as amended. Um, now this is uh, regarding our short-term uh, rental accommodation. This one and both number 10 and 11 are regarding this one. We're also going to be looking at scheduling our public hearing and delegating a chair and an alternate chair to conduct the public hearing on this. Corporate officer, is there something that, was there something that we wanted to discuss about this before? we go into it or I don't think so okay all right so uh, so we're gonna start with annex I pages 41 to 42 of the package um, electoral area directors one vote each I'd like a motion for second reading as amended for Sunshine Coast Regional District Zoning Amendment by law number 310.184-2018 so move second reading as amended and seconded all those in favor Motion carries. Next uh, is uh, Annex J uh, of our package, uh, pages 43 to 44. And this is Sunshine Coast Regional District Zoning, uh, Regional District Area A Zoning Amendment Bylaw, number 337.118-2018. So this is, um, this motion is going to be for second reading as amended and that a public hearing concerning bylaw 310.184 and 337.118 be scheduled for 7 p.m. Tuesday, April 21st, 2020 at the Seaside Center, uh, located at 5790 Torito Square in Seashell, BC, and that the board delegate a chair and alternate chair to conduct the public hearing. So we're gonna wanna look for the chair and the alternate chair for the public hearing. Uh, last time we had this, I had volunteered to be the chair, and I'm happy to do that again. And uh, Director Seegers was vice chair, and uh, it is April 21st, Tuesday. It's, uh, we asked this question last time. So the question was, should it be one of the voting directors that be vice chair? And we had asked this question last time, and because it is a hearing of the board, it it can be any member of the board, so it doesn't necessarily need to be a voting member on this item. However, if anyone would like to volunteer to be alternate chair, Director McMahon. I, I'm actually not volunteering because I think it's better for the rural directors to be able to concentrate on listening at the hearing mm -hmm. uh, because it's going to be a big public hearing. Mm -hmm. As it was last time as well. So I'm going to look around the table. I'm happy to chair. It worked out well for me last time, and, and if Director Seegers wants to vice chair, then that works too. Okay, so am I seeing any other? Yes, Director Hill. Just a procedure. If we, at that public hearing, the vice chair can vice and chair can switch roles, if we, at that moment we go, no, no it would have to be in absence. It would have to be in absence. That's why you have an yeah. alternate chair, or in is in case the chair cannot make it for that meeting. Um, in, in terms of... Uh, Director Seegers is offering to chair. Would that allow you to participate more? Would you do you feel that way, or are you happy with the, the way it was? I'm ha was I felt that I was okay. able to participate and and listen as needed. Yeah, so. and it was a, it was a good public hearing from my recollection. Yeah. Okay. Director McMahon. Oh, sorry. Director Lee had his hand up first. Didn't you? 
Oh, okay. Uh, Director McMahon first. Uh, yeah, the, the location. I had actually raised this by email, but there's already a lot of confusion over STRs in the Sunshine Coast, so I don't know if Roberts Creek Hall is available, but it's in the rural areas, whereas here we're holding a hearing about the rural areas in the district of Seashelt, and I think that that's kind of confusing optics to a lot of people. Just, just wondering if staff had looked into the availability of an alternate venue that is still large enough. I'll go over to staff for that question, and then I have a couple other directors on the line. Thank you for the question, Chair. I'm not sure what venues were considered specifically. I know size was a primary criteria, but staff here, the, the question for certainly for future cases. Thank you. Because if we are going to make this right now, we want to make sure we have the venue and everything is in the same place rather than because it's all part of the public record. Um, Director Toth. Um, I just wanted to, you know, we're proposing possible venues. I just wanted to throw out the possibility of the Seashell Nation Band Hall. Um, it's a fairly sizable venue. Uh, that being said, the District of Seashell doesn't use Seaside Center for public hearings. We use our council chambers. So anybody who attends public hearings ever uh, is going to know that they're not the same. And we don't have enough seating here for the public hearing that we're expecting, at least based on the um, based on the turnout last time. Okay. All right. So we have. Um, I'm going to review all of this that we have in front of us. So we are looking for second reading of Sunshine Coast Regional District Area Electoral Area Zoning Amendment Bylaw Number 337.118/2018. Uh, as amended, that a public hearing concerning bylaw 310.184 and 337.118 be scheduled for 7 p.m. Tuesday, April 21st, 2020, at the Seaside Center, located at 5790 Torito Street in Seashell, BC, and that the board delegate uh, Director Pratt as chair and Director Seegers as alternate chair to conduct the public hearing. And this is all electoral area directors, one vote each. Okay, so may I have a motion for that, please? So moved, seconded. Any further discussion on that? Seeing none, I'm going to call the question. All those in favor? Motion carries. Okay. Next, we have another bylaw. Uh, Annex K, pages 45 to 85 of the package. Uh, Director Toth. Thank you. Um, I'm not happy that we were so late in receiving Schedule A to this bylaw. Uh, it came through my email at 3.45 yesterday afternoon, which was less than 24 hours ago. Uh, we need time to review it, and we need to make sure that we're comfortable with it going forward. Um, I'm not happy with the communi community engagement, and I've heard complaints from people who feel a lot of this came out of nowhere, especially the staffing increases. Uh, until those concerns are mitigated, I'm not happy to move this forward. And on that note, I'd like to move deferment of this entire item until the next board meeting to ensure time to review it properly. Uh, with a deadline of March 31st, we still have two board meetings to give it the required readings. Okay. So I'm hearing for a motion to defer. And do I have a seconder for that? Or do you have a seconder? I don't see a second for defer. My final call. Seeing none, it's going to, the motion to defer is just going to expire. <laughs> expire on the floor. Okay. So, um, what we have here is for all directors. Um, we have a, um, I'm going to look for first reading. Uh, we have a weighted vote on this as the schedule below the title here. Um, and this is for first reading of Sunshine Coast Regional District Financial Plan Bylaw number 724-2020. Um, and may I ask for a motion for first reading, please? 
do you want to, oh, you have a procedural question? Sorry, we're going to go to the procedural question and then we'll go over here. Yeah, Director there, McMahon. There are some issues in and around the budget that we need to discuss. So what is the most appropriate place in this current meeting to discuss the issues like public communication, uh, the budgets and stuff? So should we put first reading on the floor and then discuss it? Where, how do we do this? I'm going to look over to staff for process. Thank you, Chair. Will you be actually discussing the amendments to the bylaw, or you could, no? Is it going to be something that would make a budget debrief going forward, or, yeah, so is it more a budget debrief on reviewing process and um, how we can do? I think there are some legitimate issues that have been raised around the communications of the budget and just, you know, circumstances about the way this has come about. And so we do need to discuss, I think, a communications plan. So for this, for this budget. But that's not a debrief. But we can certainly read it twice and then have the discussion if that makes us. Okay. Okay. All right. So, okay. So we're going to go back. Uh, okay. So Director Seegers moves uh, first reading. Uh, for financial plan bylaw number 724-2020. Uh, do I have a seconder for first reading? So seconded. All those in favor? Oops. Dis not on first reading. There's no discussion. There can be. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, when this first came forward, um, we had a discussion around having all four readings and adoption at this meeting. And um, I agree with Councillor Toth that we as directors didn't have sufficient time to actually review the material. I know what's in there. I think our, our directors know what's in there as well. Um, but we want some time to review that and we want the community to have time to look at it and review what we're bringing forward as a whole package. So giving it first two readings now and then having it come back gives us and the community time to review that and give us some input. So thank you for staff for making the amendment for that, and I'm happy to move this forward. Okay, so we have this on the floor for first reading. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay, would you like it recorded, please? Okay, we'll now look for second reading of Sunshine Coast Regional District Financial Plan Bylaw, number 724-2020. Uh, so move second reading. Do I see a motion for second reading, please? It's over here and seconded. Second, yep, yeah, I've had seconder over here, actually. Um, any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor of second reading? Opposed? Would you like that recorded? Okay, great. Okay. So with that, um, would we, are there any other comments before we move on? Uh, yes, Director McMahon. My question is, do we have a communications plan? Uh, I, I know it's very short notice. Uh, were we going to have a meeting or, um, the, the, the problem is that like the presentation that was made last month, did not have all the current figures in it. So, uh, yeah. At, well, of course, the Coast Reporter has done a great job of writing an editorial for us that uh, outlines all of the um, situation with this budget uh, very accurately. But uh, are we going to do a press release? Are we going to, uh, do we have any ideas here? It'd be nice to have a communications manager, which is in this budget. Uh, over to our CFO, please. Yeah, so uh, we most certainly can update the presentation that pr is provided, and we typically do that. We do do it after the final assessments are in, but again, um, that's because we generally adopt the budget in at the end of March, and then it happens a couple weeks later, so there's not this, the same time delay. So we can always uh, put it in draft form as we have the financial plan booklet. Uh, we're
which again, all of this um, will get finalized once all the assessment values are up to date. So we can we can do that. If we wanted to uh, record another presentation, um, we we could accommodate something like that. If if we wanted to uh, do a press release, we do typically do that. Um, there has been one press release already done so, but we can always formalize another one. Uh, if there's any uh, other thoughts about having community feedback, we have community feedback access on our budget um, through our website. Um, if there's anything public that we want to do, um, we would have to try to understand what timelines and resources would be needed for that. Directors? Director McMahon? Yeah, this is this is an ongoing issue like the town of Gibson's and their public meeting about the budget where they had to actually drag people in off the street. So uh, while people are interested in their taxes, they're not necessarily keen on going out on and attending public meetings on budget. So I think we're all wrestling with the how best to get public input. Uh, what what I can do is, you know, link to material on our website in my newsletter and uh, and in communicating with the public. And we can put messages out on Facebook and, yeah. Yeah, I think that's why uh, in considering um, not final adoption today, I think that's what staff have been uh, doing in the background. So we've put some different things on the website, even though they might be embedded in agendas, we've tried to put the, the summary of all the projects, which shows essentially what the majority of the, the budget impacts are from what was contemplated during round one and two. So the summary of all the carry forwards, so that, that link was, was sent out um, and a, 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 bl a news blast was sent out as well. So public have access to that. Um, we're continuing to incorporate some more information, so we're going to put that on our website. So for example, what are the differences between round one and round two, those figures, and whether or not there was a presentation. So we're working to put that up there as well. So as much as we can, we can continue to use um, different venues to, to communicate that information. Okay. Okay. Not seeing any other hands up. We're going to move on to our director's reports, and thank you very much to staff for that. Um, so, director's reports. I'm going to start with uh, Roberts Creek and Director Ties. Thank you, Chair. Um, not a, a ton has happened in the last uh, couple of weeks uh, for me going to events and such things, but I've certainly been very busy um, putting together my newsletter uh, uh, referring to round two budget, and uh, I've had some very good uh, um, dialogue over email with with. Uh, my newsletter subscribers and so there's been um, there's been some good discussion there for sure and um, and uh, so I, I, re I really recommend um, using newsletters especially in the electoral areas to uh, to inform uh, folks um, I've also uh, uh, use that tool to uh, inform people about the short-term rental uh, situation and, and, and I've had a, 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 a quite a, some good dialogue and back and forth regarding that as well. Um, so um, I, I really think that the newsletter is a very effective tool and uh, can, can highly recommend it. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's uh, pretty much uh, what I wanted to convey at this point in time. Uh, of course, Lower Road still closed, um, uh, but uh, it's now no longer in the hands of Fortis, but in the hands of Moti, and uh, they will be uh, trucking in more and more dirt until they feel like the situation is remedied. So um, hopefully that'll be soon. Terrific. Thank you, Director Tice. Uh Director McMahon. Uh, I also don't have a great deal to report. Certainly people in my area are very concerned about the situation with the washout in Roberts Creek because we can see the potential for the same thing happening. Uh, also Grantham's, you know, the directors toured the, uh, the Niagara of Grantham's. 
so we have a lot of uh, pretty serious concerns there. Um, I attended the Farmers Institute meeting at the public market uh, on on Tuesday night and heard from our regional agrologist and also uh, heard quite a bit of information about water licensing and water permits or, or water uh, well registration. And so I will be doing um, a piece on that for my website upcoming because I think it's a really um, important uh, issue in the rural areas. A lot of people use surface water and have wells and need to be aware of the provincial, changing provincial laws and regulations and the implications going forward. Uh, and I think that's it. My newsletter will be going out shortly too. Excellent. Uh, Director Lee. Okay. <laughs> Um, let's see, what day was that? On the 19th, um, uh, our CAO come up to Pender and give a tour of Pender Harbour out, uh, out on the, some things that you had already seen, such as the uh, Pender Harbour Landing outfall and uh, Sarah Ray Hall. But uh, we also gave him a tour of the harbour and pointed out the derelict boats that we were looking at and uh, explaining the challenges involved in handling derelict boats. It was, uh, it was fun. Oh, I mean, it was really important business. <laughs> uh, uh, Director Sigur and I attended a BCTS and Senko uh, information gathering with uh, the community um, club in Egmont and the North Lake Residents Association. Um, they were very well prepared and uh, it, it actually worked a bit against their favor because once they had all, everything in their hands, they said, well, now we got to go and see if we can mitigate it. They weren't really interested in any more details. But anyways, it was, very, it was a very good meeting and uh, I consider it a very good first step. Um, I attended a Pender Harbor Days meeting and it's, Everything's on the go for uh, July 31st, August uh, 1st and 2nd. For, uh, and we're going to have the uh, forestry boats and the mission boats there, about 14 forestry boats probably. Kind of looking forward to it. And uh, I attended the website review and I appreciated the opportunity to have feedback. But when I left, I realized uh, I'm better at critiquing than, than suggesting <laughs> positive changes. But anyways, I, I definitely appreciated the opportunity and it was good to listen. So that's it for me. Great. Thank you. Uh, Director Hiltz. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I guess I'll start off with the Grantham's Hall opening ceremony. Uh, thank you, Chair Pratt, for uh, leading that charge through in the community. We really appreciated what you did there. And to thank you to first staff for bringing that uh, project to conclusion. And and it was really a pleasure to see staff who are kind of in the back of the, in the back office who are doing the payroll and, and uh, accounts receivable to be there to see their fruits of their labor. So it was really, it was, it was a pleasure to see them there and it was a, a great turnout. So it's open for business. I don't know if there's a, been a booking yet. I don't know, but uh, it's there to be booked. There's a potluck already? No, okay. So, um, Still going here. Uh, Minister of uh, Agriculture Advisory Committee, the, the agrologist from the Minister of Agriculture was there introducing themselves and they were essentially saying that there's a, a reinvigoration and in interest of agriculture on the Sunshine Coast and there's support there for uh, workshops, uh, knowledge transfer. Uh, so there is a resource that probably hasn't been as much available to people involved in agriculture. So that, that's reassuring. Um, March the 2nd, there is an information session on a development on North Road, which will probably be the first application in the West House Sound official community plan area dealing with the densification strategy. So it's an interesting thing. So if you're around at 7 o'clock on March the 2nd, um, uh, the, the Gibsons and District Public Library will be hosting a uh, uh, or providing the venue for a truth and reconciliation event through the Swayaya Reconciliation Movement on March the 12th. 
that's a Thursday, that's from 6.30 to 9. Uh, so that'll be, uh, that, that came before the board, I think, back in January, and the, the dates are just kind of rolling out now, so. Um, I think that's, oh, and uh, the AGM for the Gibsons and District Public Library is uh, March the 7th, this uh, Saturday, or next Saturday. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna go over to Director Toth, please. Sure. Um, let's see, I, I also attended the Grantham's Hall reopening. Um, it's a neat little neighborhood that you really don't know is there unless you stumble upon it or have a reason to go there. Um, District of Seashelt staff uh, are looking at several grant opportunities to help with items such as replacing the Wakefield Road sewer lift station, which is failing, let's just say failing, uh, as well as Wharf Avenue sidewalk improvements. Uh, I did ask about climate change adaptation at Wakefield Road, and unfortunately we don't have a lot of options where this site is located, but conduits are currently exposed due to erosion, so something has to change. Uh, we'll be partnering with the Seashell Downtown Business Association on the Wharf Avenue project as they will be sending in a grant application to Ice-T for a portion of the funding. We're also reaching out to other local governments here on the coast to have a dialogue about contributing to our regional airport while we await a grant funding update. Uh, we had a five-hour committee of the whole meeting last night during which all of our departments presented their operating budget requests for 2020. Uh, I missed the council conversations, I guess it was the beginning of last week, uh, doing some emergency vehicle repairs, so hopefully Director Seeger speaks to that a little bit. Uh, we're gonna be trying to figure out how to make sure we get some community engagement into our budget building for 2020, because there aren't any surprises on the community, uh, and how we can better improve that for 2021. So that's really my update. Thank you, uh, Director Crowell. Thank you. Um, relatively quiet, um, I too attended the opening of the Grantham's Hall and um, it really was a, a very um, moving event. The building has a bit of a soft spot for me. We used to use it a lot for beach photos and uh, we just called it the, the community hall. And <laughs> but everyone knew where it was. Um, we had our first round of budget meetings with in the town of Gibsons, um, got a pretty good starting point. There's just more icing I think we want to put on the cake, but at this point, um, things are looking fairly good. And then tomorrow, I'm attending a um, seminar in West Vancouver on marine debris and um, vessels of concern. Um, so I'm looking forward to, to that. Um, that's about it for now. Thank you. Um, Director Seegers. All right, I took all the stuff off you guys have talked about already. So the Community Action Team is back up and running. We, our project manager left at the end of the first year. Uh, new funding is in place and we have a new project manager. So the group is coming together and moving that project forward. So Community Action Team is looking at a harm reduction model for opioid uh, use on the Sunshine Coast and it's involved in everything from working with peers to communicating with the general public to working with physicians who need to be trained on how to use alternative um, medications for example. So I mean there's a whole list of things that we're working on. Uh, Sunshine Coast, no, Seashelt Community Association Forum. Uh, we have in Seashelt a forum where the community associations come together and we as council meet with them probably quarterly, sometime around that. Um, and we, we bring items, they bring items, so that we have a, an opportunity to have a dialogue that's not you know, public as such, and they can ask us questions, we can ask them questions. Uh, so it works, it really works. Uh, the grade four and five class from Kinnikinnick Elementary School came on a tour of Municipal Hall. And Councilor McLean, uh, worked with our staff to figure out what we could do with them. So we did a tour and then we actually had a council meeting where they had in advance picked the mayor and the chair, or the uh, councillors. And then Councillor McLean took the role of a, of a developer who was coming in to build a water park 
and I was the staff member who gave a staff report on that, and we, we proclaimed International Candy Day. So, but they actually, they actually ran the meeting, and it was, it was quite interesting, because at the end then, we opened it up for questions from you know, the audience and so the rest of the students. And they were hesitant coming forward with questions, but then once they got on a roll, we actually had to cut it off because it was time for them to leave. So they really enjoyed it, and, and now we've had another class from Kinnikinnik request to come, so <laughs> we may be doing that again. Um, I was invited to be a judge for the 858 Skookumchuck Air Cadets Effective Speaking Competition. They, have, they had six speakers. They each came and did a six-minute prepared speech and then a three-minute impromptu speech on a topic that they were given three minutes before they had to speak. From, from this, there were three judges. Uh, it was at St. Hilda's at the In the Church um, part, portion. From this, the winner actually goes off to the next level, whatever it is, and works their way up to province and, and national. So it was, it was quite interesting. It was quite interesting to be part of that. Uh, great, great um, work. Everywhere, everything from this is my first public speech to I got this nailed. Right? It was really good. Uh, Seashell Chamber AGM. So the new chamber board was sworn in. I had the opportunity to do that, and our ML MLA spoke as the guest speaker there. So that was just previously. Uh, there are some returning members, some new ones, so there's some turnover there. It's nice to see. Council conversations. Yes, we had that at St. Hilda's. We need to do more advertising on that as well. First, first we, uh, time we did it, we had quite a few people come by. Um, and then we kind of fell off on the, court, the communication, and so we didn't have many people show up. We had more counselors there than, than public, so we'll do, some, we'll do better around the next time. Uh, Sunshine Coast Homelessness Advisory Committee meeting. Went to that one, and for your information, March 6th will be the point-in-time count on the Sunshine Coast for homelessness, hom homeless people, um, inappropriately housed or whatever housed. They are looking for more, more volunteers, so uh, they didn't quite know how many because they were starting to do the allocation, but if there are other staff members staff members or public members who would like to be involved, uh, please get a hold of me or, and I can put you in the right direction. But that's March 6th. And there are all kinds of events happening around that. So, for example, at the homeless shelter in Seashelt, they're going to have hairdressers there to come and do haircuts. Um, they're offering meals in Gibsons in Seashelt, right? So there's all kinds of different activities to have people come forward and be part of the count. Uh, Seashelt Council meeting. We, our council met with the new chief and council at the Seashelt Nation yesterday to um, basically start a conversation going forward, looking at what we are looking at accomplishing together. So it was a great opportunity for us in a, in a fairly relaxed, we had like one staff member there, I think. Uh, other than that, it was just us having a conversation. So we're moving some stuff forward there. A couple of things coming up. Game of Floods, March 19th, Seaside Center, 6 to 9. So the Game of Floods is looking at impact of climate change, particularly seaside, on a seaside community. So it's, it is, let's see, it's District of Seashell with, with support from the Bra Fra Fraser Basin Council. Uh, this is a follow-up to the climate adaptation session that we did in December of 2018. So again, that's March 19th, 6 to 9 p.m. It's open to the public um, and government, etc. So everybody's welcome to come. Uh, the CIA Reconciliation Cafe that is being held in Seashell, uh, same as what uh, Director Hiltz mentioned, Ours will be March 16th at 7 p.m., and it's at the community meeting room. So that's where we have our council meetings in the municipal hall building. Uh, that's all I have. Thanks. Terrific. Um, I will conclude the director's reports. Um, I will mention the Grantham's Hall reopening on Valentine's Day. Um, the Hall with a Heart. Uh, that was a lot of fun, and um, I'm grateful to have been able to uh, be the uh, master, mistress of ceremonies for that event. That was a lot of fun. Um, and it was so good. And we had a beautiful sunny day. And uh, it was 
it was just it was uh, it was a wonderful event so very well attended member of parliament there so many staff and love to see the um, the pride that our staff has in the work that they've done there and um, so that was it was just it was a really great event and in, including the uh, the tour to see the the chasm that is forming <laughs> due to erosion uh, and stormwater which I'll get to a little bit later um, uh, February 22nd uh, C Shelton District Public Library held their AGM a uh, couple of new board members new board chair um, Pat Harvey yeah thank you Pat Harvey um, so uh, she has a long history with the C Shelton Library Board so um, she's been off for a couple of years but it's nice to have her as a um, and thank you of course to Susan Ingerman for her role as chair um, she remains on the board um, so a few new members and um, yeah so that was great uh, Tuesday February 25th I had a rush trip to Victoria and had a meeting uh, the CAO and I um, met with Ryan Evanoff of the Ministry of Transportation Infrastructure He's the senior manager of development services uh, with the transportation services branch. And this is directly related to the uh, stormwater um, motion uh, regarding um, the board, what the board had put forward as a stormwater um, wanting to do some additional advocacy there. So uh, we're actually surprised at how quickly um, the ministry uh, took us up on, on the, um, on the, and offered us either February 25th or March 2nd and we're I'm like I'm open for both days and uh, apparently we just missed out meeting with the minister because she was otherwise engaged that day but um, wanted to have uh, extensive reporting on how it went um, so one thing about mr. Evanoff he's also the interim approving officer for lower Vancouver Island so it's uh, he really understands what's going on with subdivision approvals um, so we were meeting specifically in regards to stormwater and stormwater management um, and we presented him with the uh, motion that we're bringing forward to AVICC around stormwater management and he was very supportive of our motion very uh, gave us the thumbs up on how it was uh, written and uh, said it actually would help him with the approach that they're taking um, because they are in the process of developing terms of reference for stormwater management it is an issue across the province so it's very timely that we have this coming up they're waiting on an engineers report actually right now on what things should look like um, and he also had some great advice for us for when we do get referrals back um, apparently government agencies so government departments ministry departments don't talk to one another I know shocking right <laughs> so he said when we get one of these referrals in and if we have any additional information like for example there we have the BC timber sales plan and so we've seen that they don't necessarily see that department to department at the provincial level so when we have things like that in front of we should let them know okay so this subdivision approval you realize is below uh, you know a um, a logging operation that it is scheduled to happen within the next five years so giving them that kind of information whatever we have for local information on the ground he said make sure you put it on those referral forms when we get them so I thought that staff would like that um, yeah so it was uh, he said whatever we have for on the ground information however we can work with our local um, our local representatives within the ministries however we can do that he said it just helps them as they go up so um, uh, but um, yeah it was it was interesting to uh, to see actually the he's like we don't talk to one another <laughs> so <laughs> I was like wow that's that's not the approach that we've decided to take on the Sunshine Coast so um, so he was very very positive um, and um, and had a, a couple of comments for us on um, uh, on looking at it and uh, the, pro the provincial approving officers across the province are going to be working together on the stormwater management issue so um, so our our motion was uh, it's coming forward very timely and hopefully AVICC will uh, back it as well and uh, 
but uh, yeah, so we, we managed to get really good timing in there. So if anybody had any other questions about that meeting, Director McMahon. Uh, it's one thing about new approvals and new construction, but did they say anything about what they're going to do to retrofit the, the crumbling infrastructure that we're uh, settled with? That's part of the approach. That right now they are on, um, how did he call it, a, um, an identify and mitigate approach because it is such a large problem. So they're, they're trying to identify any of the issues and it's just as they pop up, like lower road um, <laughs> or, or what's happening in other areas. <laughs> Lowest road or, or no road in some cases. Um, yeah, so they're, they're trying to, it, it's a large issue and especially with us as we, um, as we develop up, you know, what does that mean if let's say you're at a higher elevation um, putting in a new subdivision, do you have to be concerned with everything down below? And now it's, it's that's part of the reporting that they're looking at and going forward. And yeah, yes, go ahead. While the whack-a-mole approach uh, is 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 one thing, we really need to get ahead of some of these problems before they occur. That's that's what I'm worried about because. Lower road is not going to be unique, mm -hmm. and and so whatever we can do uh, to start flagging these issues, or even as as Director Hilt suggested, um, some sort of public information campaign about homeowners and runoff from their properties and from their driveways, and the fact that they are supposed to maintain their own uh, culverts under the driveway. Mo I'm sure most people have no idea that's the case. So, you know, there's, there's a lot that can be done. So uh, do we have any uh, follow-up from that meeting? That's, that's the question. What's the next step? The next step, well, we will send a, a follow-up um, to them. Just, um, I'll send a, a follow-up thank you um, and just uh, reiterate where, you know, the items that we had discussed. Um, there's... Um, there are, um, Cowichan Valley Regional District actually has, um, has done some work on it. Um, re and I think um, I'll have to go back and double check all of my notes, but they also have something that's called a soil transportation bylaw to help mitigate clear cuts on private land, which was a really interesting thing to hear. Um, there are some stormwater management plans across Vancouver Island that we can look at as well. Um, and then, um, and then also just, I think, connecting with our approving officer as well, just on a building a relationship. So a lot of it was building the relationships and making sure that we're communicating back and forth with our local people here on the ground in other agencies. So it was a, it was a good meeting and it was just a little surprised to have it so quickly, but, um, it was great. So very positive and, um, but also at the same time a little bit. You know, when, when you're hearing from uh, a, a senior bureaucrat, like, it's a big issue across the province and we're not quite sure how we're going to deal with it. So, but it felt positive. So, happy to, uh, happy to answer any more questions on that. But seeing none, we're going to go on to new business, uh, starting off with Director Ties. You had um, a motion that you wanted to put forward. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, and that will be to request that the proposed Half Moon Bay Official Community Plan Amendment for Remainder District Lot 2392, the secret Co Heights Development Electoral Area B, be referred to the Roberts Creek OCPC. Yeah. And do I have a seconder for that? Seconded? Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Motion carries. Okay. Anything else on that? No? Okay. Uh, next, uh, Director McMahon, you had a question on Scrito. Yep. Just noticed an uh, article in the Coast Reporter that said that the Scrito contract uh, had come out of camera. It's always a funny term. Being released from in camera 
by Gibson's and Sushalt? Have we done that yet? And are we behind? And just just curious because we're all we're all signatories on it. So do we have a process where we all release together? I believe it, it's been sent out already for it was a panel type signing. So all the the contracts have been sent out already in the mail. I, I believe it's done. I could be wrong. It, it was executed, but was was it released from an in-camera meeting? Okay. Terrific. Okay. Uh, was there any other new business? Okay, we do have an in-camera session for today. Um, and so uh, we'll make the motion for the in-camera and then we will take uh, questions from the audience and from the media uh, before we go in camera. So may I have a motion that the public be excluded from attendance at the meeting in accordance with sections 91, A, C, and K of the Community Charter. So moved, seconded. All those in favor? Motion carries. Okay. <laughs>